Ladies and gentlemen, Songlu Suji reaction. This is Genghis Khan, the debut of Temujin Khan. Okay, he's gonna become a Khan here. Extra history part three. Why channel extra credits? Uh, yeah, so far this, is going, this has been such a fun series. Uh, it's surprising though, uh, knowing how Genghis Khan was a scared little kid and became the most useless uh, man in history. And also, he's gonna have a civil war with his childhood friend. I mean, imagine that in this uh, vast, big land, empire, or whatever you call it, in the country of M Mongolia, of all the people, two people who rose up are, you know, best friends from childhood. I mean, that's like, you know, saying, uh, imagine you are one of your friends at childhood. You're just, you know, you're just some kids. In this, you know, in lots of people around you, in big society, in millions and millions of people just in your area, I guess, just in your city. And then you, I guess, uh, grow up and I guess, you know, fight politically from, for becoming president or something, for opposing parties for your entire country. I mean, that does, I mean, that can happen, but that does feel weird. Like in this vast country, these two people is gonna go to the civil war. It has to be them too. This feels like really, you know, movie type scenario, right? Two best friends from childhood grow up and became, a, you know, bigger rival and had, uh, you know, fights for a long, long time. So yeah, this is gonna be a fun video. Remember, people, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the reaction date. There's a link in the description. Check out the castle place. Check out the end cards. And yeah, this is always fun. A tragic beginning, a daring escape, and a rise to power. The step has come to life with gossip. Could young upstart Temujin be the one to defy custom and unite the Mongol clans under one ruler? <music> Rumors of Temujin's daring escape from Jamaica's band traveled fast across the steppe. Respected prophets and religious leaders began to report that Temujin's ascension to power was destined by the spirits, and Temujin was 100% okay with that. All right, I don't get this. Why? I mean, these people, like, I guess, how there were oracles in Greek time, I guess they're equivalent to that, who talks about spirits and things. All right, but why are they talking about Temujin, like he's going to rise up or something? I don't understand that. Look, Temujin so far rose up because of, uh, you know, uh, two things, I guess. First thing is Ong Khan. That was his father's friend, and he was also a powerful Khan. So that helped, he helped him out with all the manpower and horses and everything. Then, how he rescued his wife, people saw how great of a leader he is. That's also helped out. Those are the two factors so far helped him out in becoming somewhat of a leader. Otherwise, he was just some other guy. All right, he wasn't, uh, you know, some, he wasn't somebody who was for the throne of some Khan or anything. No, Ong Khan is the one who helped him out there. So far, that makes sense. And then his ambitions are taking him forward. I understand that. But why are these, uh, you know, these people talking about spirits and everything saying that, Ong, uh, you know, Genghis Khan is going to rise up or something? I mean, uh, why are they helping? Are they just seeing that how there is, uh, you know, rivalry going on between, you know, Jammu Khan and Temujin? And how, you know, people are favoring uh, Temujin and how he feels like, you know, more of a, uh, you know, more of a great leader because how he rescued his wife and how people perceived of him at the time. So I guess they're just seeing that uh, out of the two, I guess, backing him feels more right, I guess. That's why they're talking about it. Because if that's the case, he's one of the most luckiest guy, right? Because even here, he got help, helped out, I guess. Because you can't just become the Genghis Khan that he was. Uh, the, who, who, you know, expanded this Mongol Empire throughout, you know, vast distances and, you know, ascend to becoming that kind of a ruler without helps like that. And he's really lucky because if they would have just go like, okay, Jamukha is gonna uh, rise up uh, to great rule or something, that would have been, uh, I guess, you know, something uh, that goes against, uh, you know, uh, Tamuj and fa favors Jamukha. I guess that would have been a roadblock for, you know, Tamujin's ascension to become Genghis Khan or something that. He summoned his followers to participate in a council called a Kurultai, which was essentially an election. Families, lineages, and clans voted by showing up. Their presence served as an endorsement, or their absence as a vote against him. Attracting a simple majority counted as a victory. Unfortunately, the turnout was scarce. The majority of steppe lineages still supported Jamaka. Temujin could work with this, though. Having now gathered all of his
allies in one place, he consolidated this small but loyal group to establish himself as a minor Khan. And thus, Temujin became Temujin Khan. He quickly sent an envoy to Ong Khan to reassert his loyalty and seek his patron's blessing, reassuring him that this new title was not meant as a challenge. Ong Khan was fine with it. He preferred that Temujin and Jamaka's ambitions stay focused against each other instead of him. With his patron's blessing secured, Temujin built up a revolutionary system of government within his tribe. A Khan's court was known as an Ordu, or Horde, and traditionally the Khan's Horde consisted exclusively of his relatives, and served as a kind of aristocracy over the rest of the tribe. Temujin, however, assigned positions of power based on loyalty and ability, without regard for familial ties. He appointed butchers, cooks, archers... This is where his strength lies, because Jamukha is the one who's more aristocratic, you know, he's more like a nobleman type of mentality, like old way is the right way. Nobleman has the top place, uh, who are a part of the court or whatever, that kind of mentality. So common men are attracting towards uh, Temujin. So this is where his power lies. He has to do this because all the noblemen and everyone is uh, towards Jamukha, you know, for obvious reason. So Temujin only held the common people who was probably outnumbering noblemen, obviously. So he has to do this. He has to show to the people like, I don't care about noblemen, not I only care about people's character, whoever that is. He has to show that. So this is, I guess this is where he's going to rise up. I guess it's going to be war between noblemen and common people. And obviously common people is going to win because he's Genghis Khan. ...guards and keepers of prized herds of livestock and horses. He also created an elite regiment of bodyguards to surround his camp at all times. Jamuka, meanwhile, still refused to acknowledge Temujin as anything other than an insolent upstart who needed to be put in his place. He carefully planned and bided his time, waiting for just the right moment to take Temujin down. That moment finally came a year after Temujin's Kurultai. One of Temujin's followers killed one of Jamaka's distant relatives during a cattle raid, and Jamaka used this as a justification to attack Temujin's camp with his vastly superior army, quickly routing Temujin's forces. Then, to prevent them from regrouping and retaliating, Jamaka perpetrated a horrific show of revenge, beheading one of the captured leaders and boiling 70 captive prisoners alive. Unfortunately for Jamaka, this cruel show- What the fuck? Ah, I hate this about, you know, all the past wars and things. Obviously, you know, understand why they did that. To send messages and things like that. But in the past, not in just Mongol Empire, but everywhere during the raids to Constantinople and things like that. Whenever raids happen, you know, an army invades, you know, they just do inhumane acts everywhere. You know, I don't know, there is, there is some, some show that showed that, you know, that somebody invaded some area and they start to kill everybody, you know, just throw kids out of the roof or something. I mean, like, to, uh, to me, you know, there should be some principles, like you want to invert, sure, you want to kill all the opposing uh, party, you know, who's, uh, you know, opposing soldier and force party, I guess, sure, uh, you know, uh, disable them, take the power, take everybody under you, even make them slaves, I guess, if that's your thing, but killing everybody, that's just effed up, killing kids, throwing off them roof or something like that. I mean, what the fuck? What did the kids do? What did other people do? Those are, those are just common people just farming and getting by. They don't care about all this political and power grabbing bullshit. I'm not naive. I understand why they did that. What is the reasoning behind it? Send a message or even tactics like if there is nobody left, nobody can oppose me or something like that. There are lots of reasons people did that. But it's still so, you know, I get stunned by seeing that like, holy shit. It used to be really effed up times in the past where people just did this kind of horrible acts. Uh, now somebody in the comments will say, oh yeah, you think that's a horrible acts, this and this and some interest here and there. I understand that. But, you know, too wrong doesn't make it right, alright? Just because there are instances of wrong things happening today, somewhere. Even though I'm pretty sure it's not the same as the, you know, I guess old time. But if the, the, there are some instances of bad thing happening today, or even in some place, that doesn't make it okay that all this shit happened. So people boiling, you know, boiling other people up just to send a message, throwing kids off the roof because, you know, the same thing just to send a message or something, that's just effed up.
blow of force backfired hard, horrifying even his staunchest allies. By treating his enemies this way, he further emphasized the divisions between the old aristocratic lineages and the abused lower classes. Temujin may have lost the battle, but this moment was a turning point in terms of public support and sympathy. More families flocked to join Temujin's camp, and he slowly began to rebuild. In 1195, a 33-year-old Temujin would be handed an unexpected opportunity in the form of a foreign raid. A group called the Jurchid approached Ong Khan asking him to raise an army and attack their enemies, the Tartars. For this raid, Ong Khan enlisted Temujin's horde. Now, Temujin had much to gain from this venture, so he gathered support of his own. He approached a small clan directly to the south of his camp, the Jerkin, and offered them spoils and glory in exchange for participating in the raid. The Jerkin gave their word. They were in. Shortly before the raid, Temujin invited the Jerkin to a feast. Unfortunately, during the celebration, Temujin's half-brother Belgate spotted two Jerkin attempting to steal horses. He identified one of the thieves as a renowned wrestler named Buri, and readied himself to fight the man as an equal, thinking that they would wrestle honorably. Instead, Buri drew his sword and cut Belgate across the shoulder. A grave insult. When the rest of the feast heard about this, it Oh, I guess that's why he's such a renowned wrestler, because he probably cheats and kill his opponents and just, you know, suppresses whatever happened there so nobody realizes what happened and people just think that he won. It turned into a drunken brawl. And by brawl, I mostly mean food fight, because in keeping with tradition, everybody had left their weapons behind. Needless to say, <laughs> when the time came to set out on a raid against the Tartars, the Jerkin never showed up to help. As with the Kurultai, absence constituted a vote of no confidence in Temujin. Victory was swift and easy all the same, and the spoils were astounding. The Tartars had access to manufactured goods from the Chinese Empire, including silk clothes and blankets and gold and silver jewelry. Captured children wore luxuries the likes of which the ragged Mongols had never seen on anyone, let alone a child. The opulence was astounding. But more importantly, Temujin saw clearly how the powerful Jurchid had just used one border tribe to fight another. And the lesson was clear. A tribe conquered today will rise up and have to be defeated again in an endless cycle of warfare with oh, no shit. decisive victory or lasting peace. Temujin will remember this. With his newfound wealth, Temujin was now prepared to push into the territories of smaller neighboring tribes. When he returned home to discover that the Jerkin had raided his camp while he was away, picking his first target became very easy. Yeah. Now that he was an experienced, battle-tested commander, Temujin and his mounted archers scattered the Jerkin with ease. With this victory in hand, Temujin instituted another revolutionary change in ruling style. See, in the traditional cycle of Mongol raiding and counterattack, the defeated tribe was looted and a few key prisoners were taken, but the rest of the tribe was left alone. Historically, those survivors would then regroup and strike back, or seek out larger rival clans to join. Temujin decided that this cycle was not in his best interests. After defeating the Jerkin, he summoned a Kurultai of all his followers and conducted a public trial of the aristocratic Jerkin leaders. For failing to fulfill their promise of joining him in war, and for raiding his camp in his absence, they were found guilty, and Temujin had them executed. After this, he went on to occupy the Jerkin lands and redistribute them amongst his followers. He then integrated the remaining Jerkin citizens into the households of his own clan, not as slaves, but as full members in good standing. He also adopted an orphaned Jerkin boy as his brother, giving him to his mother, Olun, to raise as her own son. Then, as a final sh Ooh, I see what happened there. Uh, just, uh, you know, I guess before Jamuka showed his cruelty by boiling people and everything and his just horrific, uh, you know, show of, you know, mercilessness, you know, ruthlessness. And everybody just got, you know, scared out of that. What Genghis Khan showed here is real political move, right? I mean, first of all, what he thought, like, okay, I should kill the leaders because otherwise they'll just come back. That's the tactics Europeans have been using for a long time. So, you know, that's another step in becoming a great leader, I guess. A great, you know, uh, military mind. Like, we have to do this, otherwise they're going to stab us in the back. That's understandable. But then, he didn't have, the, you know, everybody else killed. Because obviously he has to show that I'm not like Jamuka. So he integrated the people into his tribe, adopted the kid. So everybody just sees like, you know, Genghis Khan is reasonable. 
what Genghis Khan did was just, you know, killed off the people who opposed him, who wronged him. But he's a good at heart or something like that. That's a real political move there. ...show of force, Temujin summoned all of his followers, including the newly adopted Jerkin, to a feast. For the event, he also summoned Bori, the wrestler who had started that great brawl by stealing horses and cutting Belgate. Temujin ordered the two men to wrestle. Buri had never lost a match in his life, but he feared Temujin's wrath and allowed Belgate to throw him. Normally, this would mean that the match was over, but Belgate and Temujin had made their own plans. After winning, Belgate set upon the defeated Buri and broke his back. With this final merciless display, Temujin had rid himself of all the Jerkin leaders and sent a clear message to all who might oppose him. If you surrender to Temujin and remain loyal, there are great rewards to be gained. But if you betray him, there will be no mercy and nobody, not even aristocrats, are safe. Temujin moved his base of operations into Jerkin territory, continuing to conquer and attract lesser lineages. Meanwhile, Jamaka worked to establish himself as a leader and advocate for the aristocrats, who feared the threat Temujin posed to their traditions and way of life. Then, in 1201, once he had the full support of the aristocracy, Jemuka made a play for the title of ruler of all Mongols. He summoned his own Kurultai and successfully bestowed upon himself the title of Gur Khan, an ancient and revered title which meant universal ruler. This was a strategic choice. Jamaka chose this title not just because it was ancient and respected, but also because the last person to bear the title was Ong Khan's uncle, who had ruled until Ong Khan revolted and killed him. Jamaka was not just challenging Temujin here, but Ong Khan as well. If he could win this war, he would be the supreme ruler of the Central Steppe. As Temujin's patron, Ong Khan came out personally to lead his warriors in the campaign against their rival. The battle was as much psychological as it was physical. Shamans lined the rocky cliffs along the battlefield, beating rich- Oh shit, we're gonna see the battle side of, uh, you know, Genghis Khan's brilliance here, I guess. Because obviously, you know, Jamuka has a superior army, right? I mean, he does have noblemen and everything, he has resources. But then again, Genghis Khan does have Ong Khan with him, so I guess, yeah, is it equal or Jamuka still outnumbers them? I don't know. ...ritual drums to summon supporting spirits and control the weather. As they beat their drums, a massive thunderstorm gathered, which both sides attributed to the shamans supporting Temujin. This shook the resolve of many of Jamaka's warriors, and caused many to desert in fear oh, of angering shit. the spirits. Jamaka was forced to retreat. Ong Khan chased after Jamaka and the main part of his army, while Temujin gave chase to the Taichit, one of the clans loyal to Jamaka, and coincidentally, the clan that had abandoned him and his family decades Ooh, before. It's they proved difficult to defeat. Both sides fought for hours, firing from horseback, from fixed positions behind rocks, or hastily assembled barricades. Toward the end of the day, a poisoned enemy arrow struck Temujin Khan's neck, knocking him unconscious. Darkness fell, and both sides made camp on the battlefield to rest until daylight. Thanks to the aid of his loyal second-in-command, Temujin recovered by the next morning. The Taichut didn't even know that Temujin had been injured, and most of them had fled in the night. Temujin sent his warriors in pursuit, and, as with the Jerkin, publicly executed their leaders and integrated the rest, taking over their lands. He also found the family who had helped him escape 30 years prior, and freed them from their servitude. Temujin had won this fight, but Jamaka escaped Ong Khan and fled to more remote parts of the steppe to regroup and recruit new allies. Even without the Taichut, Jamaka still had many clans loyal to him. The final showdown was yet to come. Yeah, so <clears throat> that was, you know, that was just awesome. But I really hoped, you know, Extra Credit talks about Genghis Khan's tactics on the battlefield. It was clearly showing here that, you know, it was easier for Genghis Khan to defeat people. But why did he have the number at certain battles? Obviously, he didn't have numbers against Jamuka, and he kind of lost there. Uh, but, uh, you know, at all the other battles, did Genghis Khan had the number? That's why he was winning easily. Or did he have some kind of military tactics that just, like Napoleon and, I guess, you know, other great military mind of the past, he was something like that where, uh, you know, he, he uh, d did uh, certain things, certain tactics that gave him the edge. Was it that? Or was it just number? Because I would have really loved to see that. I mean, if this was Epic History TV, I guess that's what we would have seen, like how his military mind is on the field. But yeah, I guess this is just about history, not his, but still, it would have been fun to see that. 
But yeah, you know, he's uh, there's a massive battle, I guess, is going to come in the future. The next video is called Khan of All Mongols. So that's going to be a decisive video. Who's going to pick? I guess we'll know who's going to win. But still, yeah. Genghis Khan has real political mind from the start. He's uh, realizing that just leaving a tribe alive and just, you know, I guess, you know, taking some slaves and leaving them off, obviously they're going to come back. So cutting off the snake's head is really important. So cutting off all the leaders and everybody and just integrating remaining people into the tribe and consuming the tribe is a better way to go forward. So yeah. All right, people, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like, subscribe, check out the reaction, and there's a link in the description, check out the cards, please check out the end cards, and I'll see you next time.